before we begin the opening hymn, I just want to say, at least on this particular um, instrumental vocal piece, the organ begins, but it's really soft, but you'll, you'll hear the voice. So just be aware that there is organ there um, uh, behind the voice. For those of you who want to follow along in a prayer book, um, we will begin on page 77. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. <laughs>
The psalm appointed for today is portions of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, hallelujah. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here ends the reading. Let us say together the song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my savior. This is my God, and I will praise him. The God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people you redeemed. With your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them, on the mount of your possession. 
the resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Reading from the Gospel of Luke. Now on that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was the prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were not with us went to the tomb and found it is just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and their companions gathered there they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here ends the reading. <laughs>
month ago when the shelter in place protocols really took hold. There were a lot of posts on my Facebook feed about introverts and extroverts. You can imagine. Call your extroverted friends. Shelter in place is really taking a toll on them with the appropriate harrowing photo. Or on the other side, Shelter in place is an introvert's dream come true with the appropriate serene photo. Add to those the similarly stereotypical dogs versus cats posts, and I could see our universal anxieties coming out on Facebook, mostly in these cases couched in humor. As time has gone on, however, the frequency of those posts have decreased. I suspect that many of us have learned, as have I, that as much as I might have identified with at least the introvert cat-oriented humor, this shelter-in-place stuff isn't what introverts want or need any more than extroverts. This really came home to me earlier this week when, perhaps as you've experienced, our neighbors decided to do a takeout Wednesday. Everyone was encouraged to order takeout from one local restaurant to ensure that it was all delivered at the same time, and then to have an al fresco dinner, eating on your front lawn, your driveway, or porch. Wednesday evening came, and dodging rain squalls and wind gusts, most of us did head outside. Some folks gathered together on one driveway, observing the six-foot distancing requirements, thereby eliminating the need to shout across the street or lawn. Others of us simply walked up and down the street, a downside of not living on a cul-de-sac, to reconnect with folks we hadn't seen for a month or more. Our need for connection, regardless of introversion or extroversion, was great, and we were so thankful to see each other. But our gathering wasn't random or happenstance. It wasn't even a Zoom happy hour, as some neighbors, neighborhoods have hosted and ours is resisting. It was very intentional. It required advanced planning. It was physical, almost face to face. And most significantly, it involved food. Even though the idea was that everyone would eat in their own place, we couldn't do it. We needed to be together, introverts and extroverts alike. Waving from afar was insufficient. Clearly, there is something about social interaction around food that is necessary for us humans. Yet, social interactions, specifically the limited social encounters of COVID land, as I call where we live right now, are so different from our homeland. I recall learning when a kid that in some Asian cultures, handshaking was not the done thing. One might bow, perhaps with the namaste gesture, to greet another person. Well, that was interesting to learn back then. But now that we have entered COVID land, we're compelled to comply with its cultural <coughs> although similar to my childhood learning, and medically mandated practices. Handshaking is certainly out, as, and a hug as greeting isn't even done on this planet anymore. Then there was an article in the paper the other day about the fact that masks have eliminated our ability to smile at each other in the store or on walks in the neighborhood. Isolation is really uncomfortable, and it creates its own fears, so much so that I've found that I rarely say hello to folks when I'm out walking the dog. I'm afraid I'll cross some unmarked COVID boundary that even sound will transmit the virus. The specialness of a meal, as I've just mentioned, on this Sunday, with the lesson about the road to and dinner in Emmaus would usually be our focus. Indeed, we'd zoom in on the Eucharist, pardon the reference. It seems unnatural, especially since we hear a prayer relatively often, 
about the Lord being known to us in the breaking of the bread, a direct reference to this passage. But in our frequent hurry to get to the so-called key moment of the story, we miss a bunch of other stuff that, especially in these challenging times, is worthy of our attention. We most often refer to this gospel lesson as the Emmaus Road story from the first verse we heard. Now, on that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. We don't often, however, spend much time on the road, so eager are we to arrive at the destination. But the majority of the story takes place on that road. Only a few verses refer to what happened around the table in Emmaus. In Emmaus, for you history or geography buffs, is currently unidentified. There are some likely candidates, but none of them are seven miles from Jerusalem. Whether it was four miles or 20, depending on the option, probably isn't really very important, although the longer the distance, the more opportunity the disciples and their unknown traveling companion would have had to talk. Recall that this walk to Emmaus was happening on the day that the news was spreading that Jesus wasn't found in his tomb. The gospel account gives us an indication about how shocking was that news in two ways. First was the shock to the disciples that their hopes for the redemption of Israel had been dashed with Jesus' arrest and execution. But second, to hear that there had been some miraculous event resulting in the disappearance of the body. I have no doubt that folks in Jesus' day were any more willing to accept that miracles happen than we are. So certainly there was a lot to discuss. And then they're joined by this fellow traveler, perhaps seeking his relief from social isolation, but seemingly clueless. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Cleopas asked. What transpires next is, to me, the heart of the story. And I think the significant piece for us this morning as we travel through COVID land. Jesus, although unknown at this point, asked his traveling companions what had been going on. As I mentioned a minute ago, they began their response by talking about their expectations about Jesus and how those expectations had been dashed. And they did mention, of course, the report that the tomb was found empty and that angels reported that Jesus was alive. In response, Jesus upbraided them for being foolish and slow of heart in their tenacious misreading of scripture. That may not have been the most pastoral response but it certainly got their attention. And then he led them into Bible study. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. The result? Later, they recalled that their hearts were burning within them while he was talking to them on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to them. Bible study with Jesus did two things for those disciples that may be instructive for us. First, it altered their misunderstandings about the Messiah's mission. But second, that engagement with Scripture in a deep, unexpected way affected them such that their hearts burned within them. I have to wonder whether, like those disciples, like all of Jesus' disciples, we have so internalized traditional ways of understanding our scriptures and our institutions that when something unexpected, unprecedented in our lifetimes comes along, we are absolutely thrown for a loop. As some of us are learning from our reading of Canoeing the Mountains, as little as two months ago, we thought we were simply moving from a Christian world, what many call Christendom, into a post-Christian world. 
that has been a shock enough to many Christians. But then throw COVID-19 into the mix, and even the comfort and stability of our local in-place worship experiences is shaken off its foundations. Just as most scholars would point out that we'll never return to Christendom, along with many others, I suspect that we'll never quite return to pre-COVID church. And of course, the question in everyone's mind and heart is, what will that look like? Similar questions were probably in the minds of Jesus' companions on the road to Emmaus. What will our future look like if, one, our expectations about the Messiah were wrong, and two, if people can rise from the dead? We can't know the precise content of the Bible study that Jesus led, although Luke's Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles give us some idea. It's clear, however, that this encounter on the road and then at the table was critical for those disciples. And it comes at a pivotal point in the larger Luke Acts story. Very quickly, the gospel moves from being Jewish to being universal. Another sea change in expectations. It's the changed story, actually a larger capital S story, and a changed world that is ratified with the breaking of the bread and its distribution in Emmaus. It's the combination of word and sacrament that makes our meals of bread and wine so remarkable. The word, that long story of God's encounter with God's people in many remarkable ways, that word burned within their hearts. In studying scripture with Jesus, the two came to see that that long story was their story, and that the age of marvels and deliverance wasn't just something located in the past. Just as the Passover meal they had just celebrated a few days earlier included them in the Israelites' drama of redemption, the breaking of the bread in Emmaus brought them another way to know Jesus in all of his unexpected redemptive work. We are walking our seven miles through COVID land, anticipating arrival and meal at Emmaus. We can not walk the road inattentively, just biding time till dinner is served. Now we are given the opportunity really to engage the stories of our faith anew, as found in scripture and the prayer book, not knowing where that study will take us. My suspicion is that we'll have some insights, ideas about Jesus's mission to which we're called will change. And then when we are able to gather round the table on Dry Creek again, we'll recall those moments when our hearts burned within us at some new realization of how God met us in our study while in this strange land, how even this sojourn is part of a larger story. And with a rekindled appreciation of community, Jesus will be known anew to us in that breaking of the bread. As I was writing this homily, an email arrived from the neighborhood conveners. We're to meet again this coming Wednesday. As one neighbor responded to the notice, we all need to be more social, even if it's at a distance. Something special clearly happens in those social gatherings, especially around food. We're certainly sharing stories of our travels in COVID land. And I have no doubt that the same will happen for us when we can gather again around the Lord's table. May our walking and studying with Jesus burn in our hearts so that we may leave that table with a renewed sense of how to offer that feast to others, introverts or extroverts, walking along their roads to Emmaus. Amen.
It's joined together in the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. We're going to hold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. Praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to us, to, to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Sanctify, O Lord, those whom you have called to the study and practice of the arts of healing and to the prevention of disease and pain. Strengthen them with your life-giving spirit, that by their ministries the health of your community may be promoted your creation glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I bid your prayers, and you can unmute yourself for this, I bid your prayers of petition, intercession, or thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the continuing healing of the two Johns, Rose and Cox. Prayers for Bert Womack Stanley. Prayers for Marilyn. Prayers for the family of Ruth O'Neill. I see from Sam Arthur prayers for the health of Kip Hawley. We pray for the frontline workers, especially those working with the homeless. And domestic violence sufferers, shelters, for the military and their family. Prayers for uh, Laura Rodriguez and Pat McKeever. Prayers for our friend Carol Ann, whose mother passed away from the COVID virus.
Pray for Don Sheck. The repose of the soul of Sigrun Smith. For Ann Pound's son-in-law, Sean. For all these intentions spoken, unspoken, and those written in the chat feature, <laughs> all these we offer to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are celebrating birthdays or anniversaries. I know of one birthday. Um, who else is out there? Rachel Whip's birthday is today. Who else is my out there? Birthdays is, or anniversaries? My birthday is uh, next Thursday, the 29th. The, the McMahons for 38 years. All right. Uh, the Kellys for 43 years. Ooh. Jim Great has birthdays the 29th. Mary Wood's birthday is May 1st. All right. Let us pray together. Watch over your children, O oh Lord, as their days and days and days. Bless and guide them, guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. And comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up with their fall. And in their hearts, see your peace and which passes understanding. Provide all the days of their life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And today we are going to bid a fond farewell to Hardy and Susan Jones, who are leaving us later this week for Virginia to be closer to children and grandchildren. Hardy, do you want to say anything? I'm going to miss Good Shepherd. It's been a home to us. We will miss you both. Good luck to you and your family. Thank you. Best of luck as you move. Have a safe trip and a great settling in when you get there. And I hope you find a great congregation to welcome you just as much as we have welcomed you. I know you'll be an asset to whoever, whatever congregation you decide to join. Well, I'll still, I'll still be with this one till I find a place. <laughs> the the wonders of Zoom. <laughs> yes. Where in Virginia are you going? Virginia Beach. Okay. I've got some ideas for you. I'll be in touch. <laughs> okay. Do you have a place there already? No. Ah. <laughs> got several in the works, but nothing permanent. Well, Hardy and Susan, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, sheep. It's good to be back with you all. Um, and um, a special welcome to visitors. Um, I've been told that uh, <clears throat> we've had folks who have joined us who uh, nobody else on the on the um, the feed recognizes the names and they're from local and all over the place so I'm just so glad that you have chosen to spend this time on Sunday morning with us and uh, you are more than welcome to join us back on Dry Creek and Yosemite when we can meet uh, face to face. I'm so happy that you are here. Um, as uh, many of you may have seen in my announcement, um, my video announcement last week, um, despite what uh, the governor has uh, said about um, moving to safe at home, we in Arapaho County are still in shelter in place um, and we will be for quite some time. Um, as I also said in that, uh, that announcement, um, 
the bishop's office um, has let us know that basically we will be at least two weeks behind whatever uh, the governor uh, says so that we can make sure that the um, ramifications of the governor's pronouncements um, have uh, not uh, gone awry and that we can still do what we want to do. Um, that being said, I doubt we're going to be back in the building in mass for quite some time, pardon the pun on mass, um, but I, my assumption is we will still be meeting this way through all of May, uh, probably into June. Um, if there is phased in, we may be doing some services in the building um, and then also offer, um, offering a Zoom um, option um, as well, so that you can either be in the building um, or, or um, stay safe at home. Uh, we will phase this in uh, as, as time goes on, and I'll let you know um, as soon as I know anything. Um, invite you to hang out um, after um, this service for <clears throat> the second discussion mm -hmm. of, of our book, Canoeing the Mountains, to which I made reference, <laughs> and how we'll be moving into this uh, new land. Um, not yes, just COVID land, but um, but uh, uh, the the new land of post Christendom, and boy, is it going to be different once we emerge, and uh, how can we be ready to to deal with all of that? Um, I invite you too uh, to join us tomorrow evening, Sunday or Monday evening at seven. Um, I'm doing a series on sacraments at a slant. Uh, we're taking a look at all of our sacraments from a slightly different perspective, and tomorrow night we're going to be looking at the Eucharist. And um, it's just appropriate that it fell on, on this Monday night following the uh, Road to Emmaus lesson. But um, the whole focus of, of Eucharist, as, as I'll be taking tomorrow night, will be on its, um, its, its nature as, as a meal, as a sacramental meal. And, and since we're all about eating and being together however we can, um, this might be a, a particularly interesting uh, conversation for folks to to uh, jump in on. So some, tomorrow night, and the Zoom link will go out um, about that. And then the last thing I'll say is I got a couple of notices from folks that they had apparently received emails from me saying that I needed assistance and please contact me. I don't need assistance. <laughs> it's a scam. Don't respond to those things without contacting me first. Don't reply to that link email me directly if you have any questions. Um, again, I'm happy to be back with you all, um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning and through the week at uh, Morning Sheep Count or on Wednesday at Gavin with Gary or next uh, or tomorrow night or next Sunday. Very, very glad to see you. So let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor unto the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
we'll come back. We'll start the discussion in five or ten minutes. Okay. Good to see you all. Good to see you.